So previously, we set our sights on a new challenge in our journey of automation. Our medium term goal is to automate the production of machines to make the full platinum processing chain. And this thing is a complex and difficult automation challenge, but once complete will give us access to not only platinum, but also iridium, osmium and palladium, just to name a few. But this episode we're going to see just how much of a mess we can get ourselves into in this game. It's going to be some spaghetti Greg Tech goodness, I'm looking forward to this. So to recap the last episode, I had a lot of fun setting this up as well. We now have passive plastics and rubber. We built 9 fluid solidifiers, 2 assembling machines, an alloy smelter, 3 fluid extractors, a macerator, a chemical bath and an autoclave. Really all of the things we need for 5 different tiers of circuit board which is made on demand here in the brand new large chemical reactor. And that replaces this one over here, which used to be operated manually. Another machine that we replaced is the steam oven. Oh yeah, that's right, we now have ourselves a multi-smelter. In fact, we have two multi-smelters. The second one is at ore processing down here. And of course it has its own input filter, which I have expanded slightly between episodes. I also added in cassiterite, pyrite, magnetite and cinnabar. But yeah, if you've seen the end of last episode, then you know that we filled these things with nichrome coils and camphor coils. Oh wow, <laughs> we're really getting achievements for this. I guess we unlocked them after we crafted the multi-smelter, right? That's probably why we didn't get them before. Anyways, these coils we just had lying around, and since the last episode, all of the HSSG finished in the blast furnaces, which I think we'll use here for the original blast furnace. And we're gonna take out these TPV, and this blast furnace is going to be HSSG because HSSG is slightly better than the TPV and it's a little more important that we have better blast furnace coils since the blast furnace coils gives us a speed discount and energy discount while also allowing us to smelt higher tiers of recipes whereas the multi smelter here doesn't benefit from the energy discount it can only do more recipes in parallel and of course both of them will get a set of pink coils so now that that is taken care of, what is the plan for today? Well, for the platinum line, we're not only going to need the machines, we'll also need a location for the machines, right? And at the moment, there's not really a, lo a suitable location in the base. It makes a lot of sense to group it here with chemistry, since it's, it's going to be a passive process. I am also considering placing it in this room instead. But no matter where we choose to place it, we also have to do some more base expansion, and that means more base building, since we don't do lawn bases on this channel. But expanding the base also means we need some more building blocks, right, to build with. And there's a lot of areas around here, like this staircase, for example. This kind of annoys me every time I walk down here. There is a lot of areas in the base which need touched up, needless to say. So yeah, for all the base building that has to happen still, we need a lot of blocks. Some of them, like the moon rock, it's unavoidable that we have to mine this, so there's not, like, there's no other way to obtain this other than to travel to the moon. Fortunately, we should have enough for the foreseeable future, though. And we are just keeping a few thousand here. Well, 18,000 between these two chests. We have another almost 20,000 in the AE system. The rest of the blocks, on the other hand, the concrete, the basalt, the mist, agon, ism, no wait, that's missed. Ism, stone bricks, a few different versions of corp. I would like a way to automatically produce those. And since I had so much fun building this last episode, we are gonna make all of these building blocks passively. Now, I know what most of you are thinking, that is probably completely unnecessary, and you are 100% correct. We could absolutely just add a recipe in our assembling machine, at least for most of these blocks, right? And just call it a day. But that is no fun. Like I said, this is all about getting tangled up in a Greg Tech spaghetti mess. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot more of it in this process as well. So yeah, basically, sometimes jumping through the hoops is the fun part. And really, it's all just about the journey to get there. So, let's begin our journey. Alright, so we got the first part of this done, but this is where the rabbit holes immediately begin. Well, right after we craft ourselves an HV assembling machine, and we're also going to go HV cutting machine. Uh, just missing a conveyor module. And yeah, things at this point, like the MV and HV machines, are so much easier to craft because of AE, and at least some basic auto-crafting. 
yeah, we're going to go HV cutting machine, HV assembling machine. And we have pretty much the same basic infrastructure we have on the other side of, of the room. Applied energistics connection and power connection. Disconnected at the source, of course. Hello, bat. Well, that was a violent end to that bat's life. Oh, nice, he dropped us an ectoplasm. All right, so for five of seven of these blocks we want to make, it all starts with regular Minecraft stone. And for the corp, the mist, and the Aegon, those are made in an assembling machine with Z-Tone tiles and some other type of item. So we're going to have to generate a large amount of stone and Z-Tone. I haven't quite decided on how we want to generate stone yet. There's a few different options. But for this other type of item in the assembling machine, for example, mist takes mushroom, we are going to have to pull that from AE. And that means we need to make interfaces. And not just for this setup either, interfaces are going to be used all over the place. I reckon we're going to have hundreds in the next few episodes. Well, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> we need a lot of interfaces is the point, right? So I want to be able to autocraft these things. And I did touch on these interfaces briefly last episode when I set up the fluid extractors. And we need specifically molten redstone. So let's start encoding some recipes here, shall we? We already have the titanium plates. We already have EV machine casings. We need glass cable. We also need formation cores and annihilation cores. And both of these cores take the logic processor. And if we're going to make the logic processor, we might as well make the rest of the processor. These things are made with the molten redstone and the printed versions of the circuit. So let's add a recipe for the logic. Again, we can use applied energistics fluid crafting. Let's add the engineering and also the calculation. These are going to go in our fluid capable processing array here. Oh, and it looks like we are out of interface slots here. We could add a second interface, or we could add the expansion cards, of which I think we have a few from loot bags. Maybe not. Is it capacity card? I think it's capacity. Yes, these things right here. And these things, I remember, take a... Oh, yeah, they're expensive. <laughs> they're expensive. Two 16Ks, an interface, and an advance card, which takes platinum. We have four from loot bags. So one of them we're going to place in here, and that unlocks the next row, allowing us to place more patterns inside. But then we also need the inputs for this as well, right? We need the printed circuit. And these are made in the forming press. Previously, we used to make them manually in these HV forming presses. In fact, we still have the presses in these machines. Only now we have the multi-block forming press. And I think it's this guy here. So what we are going to do is give a press to each one of these input buses on the same machine. But we are going to have to craft a few interfaces to make interfaces. Hopefully we have enough material to craft a few here. Uh, three is all we can make right now. I think that's going to be enough. So yeah, we give one to each input bus and plug them in. Also make sure we give them a name as well. So it's going to be forming press and then whatever mold it is. So this one is engineering. Forming press calculation. This one I have a recipe in for the fluid circuit, which doesn't necessarily need the press, but I think we can still share the interface here for the forming press. So we'll change the name of this from empty to silicon. And the last one is logic. So now we should be able to add recipes for all this stuff. Printed silicon is silicon solar grade poly SI plates. And we'll do this like 16 at a time. And speaking of the silicon, I did actually run a bunch of silicon through this little machine through here. There's only 38, but I did actually toss them in the blast furnace as well, which should actually be finished by now. Yeah, there's a couple of stacks here. And the recipe for the circuit calls for plates, so we'll also have to add a bending machine recipe for plates, or ingots to plates. This one goes in the bending machine, and the other one goes in the silicon forming press here. Same thing for engineering, which takes diamonds. This is the reason I placed the multi-block miner on the diamond vein last episode. And the other one for gold, which we can now smell in our molly smelter. So everything is interconnected here, <laughs> which is both uh, awesome and kind of scary at the same time. Yeah, so logic, engineering, and calculation. All right, perfect. And now for the annihilation core, we also need nether quartz rods, which is made in the lathe. We'll do this a full stack at a time. And the formation core takes certus quartz rods, also made in the lathe. And the lathe we have over here as a single block machine. I don't know why I'm over at the machine. We could have added it through the interface terminal. Let's add those patterns in here. And you may also notice for the annihilation cores, we also need pure fluix. We are just going to add a recipe for the seed here in the assembling machine. Fluix, dust, and sand. And we'll toss a whole bunch here in our makeshift system. Uh, it's the autoclave we need. Yeah, we need to move all this over to the new section of the base. We need an area for, the, for distilled water. 
an autoclave, a mixer, and a chemical reactor. Honestly though, our list is, is so long today, so we have to keep things moving a little bit. So for now, we're just gonna batch craft. And it's nice to see this system is still running for titanium. I come and fill this thing every single day. We have so much rutile to process. And look at this, another 1000 titanium. I'll take it. <laughs> I will take it for sure. Oh yeah, check this out, almost 3000 titanium. 3600 once we add all that in. That should help us to make EV machine casings. Let's get like 17 or so crafted. And this of course is used in the interface craft. There is also still glass cable, which we're missing a recipe for. Actually, that is just an assembler recipe. Oh yeah, and there's also a need for us to make Fluix dust. We have a, a decent backlog. The most efficient way is in the mixer, but we don't really have a mixer yet. So what we are gonna do is repurpose this macerator. Oh, wait a second, this is EV power. And this is HV macerator. That was a close call, I'm not gonna lie. I almost did plug that in. But, but we're gonna make sure we transform down. So HV transformer here, EV to HV, then the HV macerator, and this will just simply be macerator. Nice, and we have another machine we can add recipes to. So just out of curiosity, can we now add like 64 logic processors? That's almost 10 buckets of redstone. It does seem to be crafting though. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, things are working, nice. All right, so now that we have slightly easier ability to make interfaces, we can request all the items we need for these machines here. But we do need a few more machines. I do have an extra bending machine. Yeah, just for fun though, we are gonna do one machine per block. So that is gonna be a fair number of machines we need. Since it is passive though, it doesn't need to be super fast. So most of them are gonna be MV, apart from these two here, the cutting machine and the assembler. But yeah, right now we have some crafting to do. Alright, well this time I don't think there's any scope creep, unlike last episode. I believe we got everything planned here. I did just realise we were one assembling machine short though, which is going to go right here, and now we should have all the machines we need. Okay, so let's start at the very beginning here with two EV rock breakers. And you might hear some fires, there's nothing on fire. I don't know what exactly it is, but uh, we get that sound every now and then because of the lava. They are EV because I was going to craft the boulder nator. Boulder nator? Yeah, boulder nator. Basically the GT++ rock breaker. And honestly, the recipe didn't look too bad. It does require the EV rock breaker to upgrade. Doesn't look too bad until you see the casings. And this is a, an HV circuit each plus a whole bunch of GT++ alloys. And then on top of that, you need the thermal casing, which is red steel, black steel. Yeah, that was going to be a whole other rabbit hole, which we might still jump into. But look at this. I don't think we need faster stone than that for now, right? So the top machine here is for stone. We need to unfortunately have the lava on top. We're gonna make sure we lock the drawer and this is gonna automatically output into the right hand side. And the bottom one is gonna be on circuit one. And this will end up very similar to the LV rock breaker, which we have here. And this one, instead of making stone is gonna make obsidian. So to do that, I think it's circuit one and we need to give this thing redstone. So underneath here, we have a conduit connection and you guys know how this goes by now, right? Insert brown. No, not extract blue. We want to automatically output to the drawer controller. This is going to receive redstone dust. And so the ME conduit shares a block space with the Fluix cable. And that goes into an interface up here, where we're also going to request redstone. And things are probably not connected, are they? I forgot to link the P2P. I forgot to link the P2P again. And this time we're going to have to add another ME controller and a fresh P2P tunnel. And this is getting really bad. Oh boy. <laughs> This looks so spaghetti. Yeah, the rewire is coming very, very soon. Perhaps on a live stream? We can do this for now. No, wait, we can't do that because that connects to... Yeah, rewire very, very soon. All right, and now that we have channels, we should see redstone appearing in here. That timing was perfect. And we're making ourselves obsidian, which we're also gonna output and buffer in the drawer. And we're just gonna let these drawers fill to capacity. In fact, we might even upgrade these things. Oh, look at that, already 3,000 stone in here. 
Alright, so as always, we're going to have to give this drawer controller a storage bus, and it's going to be high priority. I still get questions about the priority system on applied energistics devices. For me to keep it simple, I always do plus a thousand or minus a thousand or zero. But high priority storage means it will be stored here first. So if there's any space in the drawer, which is unlikely, then obsidian, any obsidian we place into the terminal will go here first. However, because it's high priority, it's going to be extracted last. So if we take any obsidian from the system, it's going to take from here last. And any in the drives will be taken first if we pull out a stack here. And doing low priority is the opposite. So high priority storage is insert first, extract last. Low priority storage is extract first, insert last. Okay, so now what we need to do is make those Z-tone tiles, which are made with stone slabs, and that is what the cutting machine is for. The cutting machine also needs a source of water, so we're gonna use a reservoir and a pump on the side for insertion. Very, very simple. It's more efficient to use distilled water or lubricant, but honestly, the stone recipe is super fast, I think. If we give the machine power, any others disconnected? Oh yeah, they're all disconnected here. Honestly, that isn't as fast as I was expecting, but remember, this is fully passive, so we're going to store this again in the drawer. And so now to make the Z-Tone tile, we're going to use the assembler recipe. Since it is a bit more efficient on stone slabs, you use half the amount. So again, we can set an item filler for stone and stone slabs. Insert brown. And instead of pulling directly from the machine, we're actually going to pull from the AE system. We are going to request those items in the interface as well. And that way, because of the priority system that we use on all of the storage devices in AE, it should help to keep the drives nice and clean as well because it's going to pull from there first and then it's going to take any extra stone from here. Although saying that, we do have a drawer on high priority in our storage room, which I'm sure does have stone and obsidian inside. And these are also on a thousand priority, I'm pretty sure anyway. Yeah, so these are going to be treated exactly the same. So now, enabling the extract on the conduit of the interface, we should see stone and stone slabs. Circuit 1 is going to give us Z-tones. Again, we store in the drawer. Oh yeah, and we'll need one more for the stone in the cutting machine here. Alright, so now what we have to do is combine those Z-tones with five different items, and we should end up with Corp, Mist, Aegon, Ism, and Concrete. Let's start with the Mist, and I did actually, between the episodes, hang out with Breeks for a little while. And I had him make us some more seeds, both black dye and brown mushroom. I have since stopped him just to uh, prevent the weeds, because if you, if you leave this guy running perpetually, then eventually the weeds do spread. So I made sure to stop him, and we should have a lot of seeds in here. And again, lots of this we can't actually get fully operational yet. We're really, really banking on this ender chest. <laughs> in fact, we, we might even see if there's any loot bags available. For now, we're going to allocate a decent amount of this space to brown mushroom. And we also have some blackthorn, which can give us black dye. Or ink sacks, rather, which effectively is black dye. Yeah, this should be a good start. We have a few seeds spare. We can always add to this later, later on. And you know what? In fact, in anticipation for this inner chest, I've already filtered in their own drawers here in the storage room. So the idea is we place the ender chest input into this drawer controller and that should feed everything into where it needs to be. And then things like the salty root and the sugar beets, insulin dust. Yeah, we already have processing. That's what these machines here are for. So for the mist, we can just request mushroom. Oh yeah, and we're gonna need a storage bus here. So that connects all the drawer networks together. In fact, we'll need a, a second one for this drawer network because remember the range is only four. And again, this will be high priority since it's main storage. And yeah, that should allow us to filter in Mushroom and Z-Tone into the assembler. It's going to be Insert Brown, Extract Blue. The blue extraction goes back into the drawer controller. And we're now automatically making mist blocks. Corp is just combining the Obsidian and Z-Tone, Circuit 5. Awesome, that's the next one off the list. Corp 3, but those are the two easy ones. Aegon and Ism use some form of dye, and it's going to be grey dye and light grey dye. So right now we're going to set the filters in the machine and come back to those. Insert brown, extract blue, grey dye and Z-tone. And the other assembler over here is also going to get Z-tone and light grey dye. And before we get back to those, we have a decision to make. How much stainless steel do we have? If I can spell. A thousand. Just over a thousand. Yeah, so one of the other blocks we use in very high quantities is all of this concrete. And this is from Railcraft. And to make this version of concrete, we need stone, which we have and rebar. 
Rebar is made in a bending machine from rods, and we can either use steel, raw iron, bronze, titanium, iron, stainless steel, aluminium, or iridium, or osmium, or tungsten steel. <laughs> yeah, each of them of course give us a different amount. However, honestly, I think we're just going to go for the cheapest one, which is going to be iron, and we have thousands of iron. Like 19k dust, 4, 000, almost 5,000 ingots. There's almost 2,000 roasted iron, which is 1 to 1. 2,000 banded iron. I think we have some pyrite as well, which is not all being smelted. Oh, and you know what? That actually reminds me. We can add these things to the multi-smelter filter. Roasted iron and roasted nickel can also be added here. But yeah, I think we're going to use iron rods for this. So we have an extruder, which is going to get the rod shape. This is going to turn iron into rods. And then the bending machine is going to turn it into rebar. And the alloy smeller is going to combine with stone into concrete. Alright, and once we set all the fillers and give them muffler upgrades, these are very loud machines. For these two specific cases, the iron rods and the rebar, we're not going to go into the drawer. We're just going to send them and pass them between the two machines. One more muffler. <laughs> Those are so loud. So, so loud. It may not be such a bad idea to buffer iron rods since we use these like in a, quite a lot of cases. I would rather make sure the iron is available. I don't want to be surprised what, by a massive need for iron here soon. And it's all sitting here making concrete. We'll just make sure we adjust the levels based on how much concrete we store. And we can make all the extra iron rods we need in the extruder here. Which still needs configured. I still haven't fixed this. So other than the dyes for the ism and Aegon, the other thing we haven't talked about yet is the compressor. And this is going to get filtered in basalt dust. And that is to make all of these blocks here. We are going to have to add a second interface, but that is okay. And another muffler. However, we are now making basalt. And this basalt dust, where are we going to get this from? Oh, another thing. Is this fast enough? Uh, I think it will be, right? Yeah, it should be fast enough, considering it's passive. Basalt dust we can also make from black stone lily here. However, right now it's given us black granite, which is important. We need black granite to centrifuge into biotite and then into fluorine, which is for polytetrafluoroethylene. And the way that you switch it around is by changing which block is underneath. So right now it's black granite. We are going to change that to basalt, and that should give us the basalt dust. This one we are going to keep as black granite though. And it might be the case that we have to add another few fields of Blackstone Lily. But we're not going to be able to tell that until we get these operational. Maybe just to test now when we harvest, we should get Basalt Dust, right? Yes, perfect. And this thing, we can also give a drawer here at the storage room. Down here. Oh, and that was instantly sent. It's gone. Yeah, that must mean it was sent to this compressor. Perfect. Alright, I think after some filtering and a bunch of different crafters here, we should have all of the dyes now fixed. And I think everything in our pin list. But yeah, I went with these Ender IO crafters, which craft us bone meal. No, it doesn't craft us bone meal. It crafts us grey dye from bone meal and ink sacks. The ink sacks we get from the farm and the bone meal we also get from the farm. Yeah, there is these crops here called corpse plant, which has a chance of giving us bone meal. I think we may and bones. I think we might have to add some more. I'm pretty sure it can give us bone meal directly though, even though there's no crafting table recipe for it here. I tried a bunch of different crafters though. I made these auto workbenches, but these had the problem of uh, not being able to limit the amount of items you give it because there's no such thing as a limited item filler in GTNH. And you don't realize how useful those things are until they're taken away. So the, uh, the Ender IO crafter is able to limit the items that it's given and only accepts items for its recipe. So this one makes us grey dye, and then it takes grey dye and mixes with more bone meal for light grey dye. The light grey dye is sent in here, and this gives us Aegon. And the regular grey dye is sent here for Ism. Oh yeah, and it looks like only now we're, we're finally filling the buffer on rebar. How much iron do, are we down to? Still, f still 4,000. Okay, that's not so bad. Yeah, so like 1,000 iron to make some concrete. <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. But yeah, everything else here seems to be working pretty well. And you guys might also start to leave some comments about ashes. I know about the ashes, the, the pile of ashes. 
in the nether here, which is somewhere we haven't been for a while. In the nether you can find the ash block, and you can mine this for the pile of ashes. In fact, you can get quite a lot pretty fast. Yeah, look at this, already four stacks, and this, this converts into grey dye. So it's not super important that we, we farm a ton of corpse plant for bone meal. And in fact, I may just convert it full time to doing ashes. The thing is, I'm not sure if there's an automated way to get ashes. It might just be that we have to collect this manually every now and then. But it is a really good deal, the ashes, uh, the pile of ashes. Either way though, we should have plenty of dye and ashes and building blocks in general uh, to expand our base. It looks like the buffers are, have already filled though by now. Oh yeah, we have a lot of blocks to work with, besides basalt, which we're forever out of until we get the farm up, up and running. Speaking of though, we do have two quests here for the bending machine or the industrial material press, and also for the extruder. Do we happen to have any motors? We do. Aha, uh -huh, we can get ourselves two more IV bags. Come on, Greg Tech, the ender tank. No, not ender tank, ender chest. <laughs> <gasps> Wait a sec, we, we just got a dimensional transceiver. These can do items, fluids, and power, right? Yeah, transports items, fluids, and power wirelessly across distance and between dimensions. Oh, <laughs> I think we might just sort of fixed our problem here with the with the farm. If I remember right though, we need to keep at least one side powered. Oh, forget these data, what is this? Siren Beauty Dying Rubber? Yeah, forget those things. I'm sure that we have to keep one of these sides uh, powered, but we might be able to do it from the Creeper Egg. If we actually had the Master Magic Energy Absorber, it's still over here in the overworld. Okay, put the Energy Absorber back here. Make sure it's pointing down. Creeper egg on top of that. That should give everything power. Although I think all the crop managers are disabled. Is this thing getting power though? Hmm, upkeep is 500 RF a tick. That might be an issue. That might be an issue because we're not making 500 RF. I mean we are, but we also need to distribute that to a few crop managers also. Hmm, maybe let me play around with this and see if we can make it work. It doesn't seem like we're able to give it much power. Alright, so it's been a little while. I think I got this figured out, but there's some other implications for other areas in the base. Like, for example, the chemistry area or fluid handling. But first on the farm side, we got the dimensional transceiver disconnected from this power line. And instead it receives its power from uh, from another dimension, it receives it on main power. It's on receive mode for this channel. And then the item mode is on send mode for IC2 crops. We have some electrum item pipe, which comes from the crop managers. And that goes into two chest buffers. I couldn't get it to go straight into the transceiver, but this is just a small buffer chest with a conveyor built in, pretty much. And right now the only farm that's turned on is this one for black granite and endstone. So we, we have quite a decent amount of, black, of basalt and black granite. And we get like half a stack per crop per harvest, thanks to this guy right here. <laughs> because of the good stats on the crops, we get, we get so many drops from these things, it's crazy. It's honestly crazy. And on the other side, I really struggled on a placement for this thing. Where on earth do we place a dimensional transceiver? It really would have been ideal to place it next to the drawer controller. I think it's also becoming a blood moon. Only we have to give this thing power, right? So we're plugging it into the same cable that powers Applied Energistics. And so this one is on Send Power and Receive Items. Basically the inverse of the one at the farm. And yeah, you can see here, Endstone Dust, Black Granite and Basalt. I think it only keeps one of each stack. One of each unique stack in the internal buffer. But all of the internal buffer is going to go into an item pipe with a conveyor module. Set to Import. And for now we're going to place it into a chest. All right, so I ended up waiting out the Blood Moon and you might also notice some changes up here. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second, but we're placing it in a chest because I wanna make sure it does actually go into this drawer system. So we are gonna double, triple check that this is on a thousand priority. In fact, we might even put it a little higher. And this is actually online as well, right? Yes, correct, it is online. So because we can't send it directly into the drawer controller because we have to give it power, we are going to instead send it into an interface and that theoretically means it can go anywhere on the network that there's storage available. And well, there is storage available in the drives and we do not want the farm to just fill the drives constantly. Which by the way, I had to craft a few more recently, very recently. 
But yeah, we're gonna take what we learned earlier, or what we covered earlier with the storage priorities. Because this is a thousand priority, it, it will insert here first, but we want to make sure we void overflow these things so that any excess does not end up in the drawers and instead is just voided in the drawer. So we want a void upgrade on every single one of these drawers which takes items from the farm because the farm will produce infinitely, right? As long as the chunks are loaded. Oh, it doesn't look like I crafted enough either. We're gonna be a few short. We are th three void upgrades short. I did plan ahead though. I think we we, ha we should have some more obsidian dense plating in here. Yeah, look how slow this recipe is. <laughs> we could probably do it in the new one, but yeah, I just filled the chest with obsidian plates. And to craft a void upgrade, it also costs pistons. And in this pack, pistons are not super easy to make. Fortunately, we do now have fluid crafting, so we can make use of redstone. And we should have a pattern in this, in our system for it now. So I think we can request... We're missing the recipe for oak slabs, which are in the cutting machine. You know what? We should really change this from oak to spruce. Yeah, we'll use the, the spruce planks instead. These types of planks, which are cut from the slab. And those are all done in the cutting machine, which is inside the clean room here. Which, again, still has to be moved. We're eventually going to move these things out of here. And technically, we don't even really need the laser engravers here anymore. And that means that the piston recipe can be changed from oak planks to spruce planks once they start crafting. Now we should be able to request some pistons, right? Hopefully this works. It does say that it's crafting. Oh, perfect. I love this feeling when you, when you, when you finally get things automated. That allows us to craft the upgrade template, and it's three templates per void upgrade, plus two dense obsidian plates. So, so yeah, these things are super obnoxious. But now we can void upgrade the last three drawers, and we should also be able to switch out this chest with an interface. As you can see here, we do have a P2P tunnel. That's just to give it a channel. I can foresee this getting moved though once we rewire the controller, but we'll see. That The rewire is actually becoming a huge priority at this point. Okay, this should establish a channel any second, and that should allow us to ingest all the stuff from the farm. And it should first end up in the drawers, and then it's gonna be sent to wherever it gets processed. In the case of Endstone, for example, let's also, also hide this from the terminal. Endstone, for example, should be sent to the centrifuge back here and it looks like it's already turned on that's perfect so yeah just as a reminder endstone can give us helium which we need for blast furnaces it can give us tungstate it can give us platinum metallic powder which we'll need a lot of here for the plat line this is effectively our input and we also get sand and we do have storage set up for it the reason i have these here is because we need to also put void upgrades on these as well it looks like the only one we have it on is plant balls right now and also the more time i spend in the green room here i'm not super happy with this cable I thought it would look pretty cool, but it's actually quite goofy. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that that's going to get changed. I'm going to redo the storage for this. All right, so now we can actually turn on the rest of the farms, or at least we should be able to. And that should send all of the rest of the items. As I mentioned, this one is the only one operational right now. But we should just be able to hit the crop manager and turn it on. Now that didn't give us a full harvest. I think that voided a lot of the crops there because they were all harvested at once and there's not enough space in the buffer here. But that really isn't going to be an issue other than on first startup and the crops are all fully grown. Like all of these things grow at different speeds, right? So there's theoretically always going to be space. And we have the void upgrade on the other side, so nothing should ever end up jammed. All right, let's turn on the sugar beets and the brown mushroom and the black thorn. And then finally, red granite, blaze reed, glowing earth coral, glow flower, which is for glowstone. We have some slime plants here for slime balls. And then of course the, cor the corpse plant. Let's turn this farm on. All right, so that should be all the farms operational now. And sticky resin we get over here. And now returning back to base, we should see a lot more machine activity in this room. This one here extracts sugar beets into sugar and then sugar into oxygen here. Raw rubber dust is converted in, or sticky resin is converted into raw rubber dust, as well as plant balls, which are stored in the drawers here. And also refined glue, which is used for these circuit boards in this assembling machine. The raw rubber dust is also sent over to this chemical reactor to make us rubber. No, this one here to make us rubber. And it looks like we're also starting to get PVC. I assume because we're now getting chlorine from this electrolyzer. Chlorine was a huge, huge problem. Oh yeah, I can also see that compressor turn on. Oh yeah, also check this out. I have to show you guys this. Look at this. <laughs> I also added one of our uh, maintenance entrances to the wiring room. 
It's just the tiny little things like this that make all the difference, right? Normally we place it like right here, but it was kind of in an awkward space or an awkward spot because of the way this kind of lines up with the walkway. And it doesn't really exist on the other side here, the symmetrical side. I mean, it's not super symmetrical, but the general shape of the room is the same. Anyways, yeah, these things are also extracting uh, into glowstone, which are stored in the drawers over here. Already 292. Yeah, we need some void upgrades for these ones too. But importantly, how is fluid storage handling this? We should see we should see chlorine go up for a start. Oh yeah. This was down at like 60 buckets. We're now at 800. Look how fast that's going up. <laughs> that is awesome. That is that is awesome. Helium, we should also get helium from the end stone. Oxygen, we should start to see some oxygen here. I mean, we, we've already had a lot of oxygen for a while. We get this from a few different places. Hydrogen. No, we don't make hydrogen from crops. Where is the other one? Rubber, I guess, was already full. Okay, the one thing we have to decide on is the oxygen, I think. I don't know whether we should void excess. I don't think that's going to be a good idea, though. I think what we should do is just make sure this one stops when whenever the oxygen tank is full. Because th this basically the only job of this electrolyzer is to make us oxygen. So there's no point in running it if there's nowhere for it to go, right? But it is an, a GT++ machine, so it, as long as we don't have void excess on, that should be its default behavior, right? So if this output hatch ever fills up, we can simulate that by uh, disconnecting the P2P. Yeah, it's going to start to fill with oxygen and we should see it turn off. I'm like 99% sure it's going to turn itself off. Otherwise, we would have to add a wireless redstone signal. But yeah, it looks like it is stopped now and it does have some sugar in the input. So yeah, we don't have to worry about a wireless redstone signal here. Also, same for this one. This is going to stop whenever we have enough helium. However, this one also makes us tungstate and also platinum metallic powder which we definitely do want to keep producing. So I'm going to void excess on helium and we'll just build a bigger tank if we need a bigger buffer. So this one will get a void excess. Other than that though, I think the only other change we can make to this now is turning on some more of these systems. So I'm going to turn on epichlorohydrin again here and I'm also going to turn on epoxid so we can start buffering some more. Our biggest bottleneck for this was chlorine. So uh, now that we have some more of that, we can get this going again. Oh yeah, all these LCRs are spilling up. Now, this doesn't mean that there's more likely chance of maintenance. I do check these machines every single day for maintenance issues. And right now, other than maybe adding a maintenance light, which I might actually do on all these things, other than giving us some sort of maintenance light, there's not a really a whole lot we can do about maintenance at this point in the game. These ones are all okay. Yeah, all of these are still working okay. What is this? Iron 3 chloride? We can also turn the iron 3 back on. That is going to fill the tank to capacity now that we're getting things passively, right? And of course, the iron three and epoxid is used in these setups here for all of the circuit boards that we set up last episode. So now you can see how everything in this game is interconnected. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, this pack is really no joke. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy if you're not prepared for it. It is a spaghetti mess. <laughs> And honestly, sometimes I'm not prepared for it either. So I spent some time, I took a little break and I spent some time building here. And this is, I think, something I'm just going to chip away at every now and then. Because doing it all at once, like building the whole base at once uh, is kind of exhausting. Same with the automation though. That's why I kind of like to switch back, in, back and forth between the two tasks. But I also wanted to try to experiment with some gardens here, perhaps. Maybe try to add in some color from nature. Maybe like a waterfall or something or other. Maybe even a statue. I might try to put some sort of statue in here just to try to give it some visual interest. I'm not exactly sure what I want with this yet. I was thinking about some sort of glass dome on the, on the top. That could be pretty cool. If you guys have any suggestions though, I'm definitely open to suggestions. Right now though, I've also been working on another little side project here. And this was originally for the boulder nator. I mentioned for the casings on this thing, we need red steel, black steel, and red steel, black steel are used all over the place. And if you look at the recipe, this is a mixer recipe. It needs steel dust, nickel dust, black bronze, which is electrum copper, electrum is gold silver, and then black bronze is used for black steel. Black steel is used for energetic silver, energetic alloy, red and blue steel, and those are again are used elsewhere. Flux electrum, for example. Energetic alloy is also used in vibrant alloy. 
and vibrant alloys you also used elsewhere. So we need a lot of automation in the mixer. And we're going to go for the GT++ mixer, which, is on, which was on our checklist a few episodes back. We didn't quite get around to making it yet, but I think we have the materials this episode. We need to make some borosilicate glass. And this is done in the fluid solidifier. I had a look at the other version of the glass. There is also thorium yttrium glass you can make, but this needs an IV blast furnace. And then I realized our blast furnaces are only EV. And these are also something else that need a location in the base. But now that we have building blocks, all we need is patience and time. <laughs> and a lot of creativity to try to design all of these areas. It gets quite exhausting, I'm not going to lie to you guys. It's, uh, it's quite a lot to try to get everything designed and then also craft on top of that as well. And things are getting quite crazy at this point in the game, which is why automation is key. And I'm not entirely sure how we're going to automate the fluid solidifier, because that is something that needs to happen. Oh boy, this recipe is slow. Well, in the meantime, there is also the casings we need for the mixer. Uh, there's some titanium turbine casings, which I already have made up. We've got the usual energy hatches, a quadruple input hatch, since the mixer also takes fluids, input bus, interfaces, muffler hatch, and we also need the casings for this, which is multi-use casings, staboloy, stainless steel, zirconium carbide frame boxes. <laughs> we should have everything though. This took a while to, to gather all of this up. But yeah, 26 it looks like we need. That's also our quest, or the achievement rather. 23, 25, 26, and we can make a few more. We might end up with more than one mixer. But yeah, now that we have the glass, we can make up the IV mixer, our second IV mixer. In fact, you know what? I This is our, <laughs> yeah, this is our second IV mixer. We have one here, which we needed for something or other. I think it was HSSG. We probably should have used that one. Anyways, we can upgrade the second one into the industrial mixing machine. And a request. Wait, that also means one more loot bag, correct? One more IV bag and chocolate dough. Wait a second. One more fortune book. We should have a motor on us, right? There's no way we get an ender chest from this. No way. <laughs> I mean, it's not quite, not quite the ender chest, but... Uh, I do not believe that. I really do not believe that. That's so funny. And some platinum cable, which we can recycle into pure platinum. That's pretty nice. <laughs> but yeah, with that, we do also need to expand this room here, since there's not really space for the mixer. It is 3x3x4, and th this I have some plans for some, some other machine, so I don't want to use that space right there. And the rest are already taken. These are chunk boundaries, so we're going to place single block machines here. In fact, I might even move this macerator and we can put the mixer here. However, I think we're going to have to tackle all of that next episode. But yeah, I'm super happy we got chlorine fixed, especially chlorine was a big one. We got the blocks automated, of course. And yeah, we're well on our way to the platinum line, which also needs a rim design. Oh my goodness, there's so much to do. So, so much to do. But that is going to be it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you all in the next episode of New Horizons.